It is finally here. Amazon's The Rings of Power has arrived and the war of the fandom has begun. Fans have begun dropping more bombs than Obama, while the shills have been ingested more rat poison and propane than Marshall Applewhite. And already we've seen the erasure of honest, sorry, negative reviews to artificially boost the numbers like a man's height on Tinder. And no matter how many voices are suppressed, Amazon and the corporate media cannot hold back this tidal wave. I'll be covering each episode so you don't have to suffer this ghost pepper to the eyes, and this first episode will establish what I'm going to focus on with brief mention of the fish in the barrel complaints taken care of before covering the episode. So, if you want more, then please subscribe to join my kingdom. Now, our tale begins with Galadriel as a kid being bullied by other kids, because the elves totally did that. And her brother, short haired Mick Won't Live Long, attempts to give her a metaphor with all the depth of high diving into a puddle on asphalt. Then, we fast forward, presumably about a thousand years, briefly touching on the twin trees of Valinor, which provided light to the whole of Arda, being unplugged by. By Morgoth because the Velar ran up that electric bill. And of course, the elves retaliated and a war broke out, concluding with Morgoth's defeat off screen because the primary antagonist of the Silmarillion would require both good and faithful writers to put on screen. During this war, Sauron was Morgoth's right hand man, and again, main focus because we can't get away from what Jackson already brought to life. And Galadriel is on the hunt because her aforementioned brother is dead and branded on a table, so she takes her brother's dagger and runs off to go fight the good fight. Because you see, Galadriel quickly rose through the ranks to lead armies, but apparently only has a small fellowship, if you will, of brethren with her, and she has pushed them to their absolute limits, marching through the sub-zero blizzards of Forodwaith like they want Subway at two in the morning. Galadriel was even willing to leave one of her soldiers behind because the dude fell over like two feet behind them. Regardless, the group finds one of the strongholds and the same mysterious brand just as a snow troll attacks the group and might as well have been screaming, this is Sauron country. Then Galadriel flawless victories the motherfucker and the other elves have had enough and just want to go home. And so she does. Galadriel throws away her centuries-long obsession to return to Linden. There, she meets up with Elrond the Foreheaded and Gilgalad the Double-Chinned, who offers them safe passage in return to Valinor. And again, Galadriel just goes with this, sailing across the Sundering Seas, and just as she's about to enter the ancient home, Galadriel fucking abandons ship and tries to backstroke all the way to Middle-earth. Parallel to these events, we are introduced to Erendir, who may as well be Don Lemon's better-looking stunt double. So, the Fresh Prince of Noldor, as I will call him from now on, and a small battalion of elves occupy the Southlands, the small region next to Mordor, ever vigilant of Sauron's return. He and the other elves are not looked kindly upon when the Fresh Prince of Noldor and another return to Tirharad because he's, well, darker than suntan lotion. You see, the battalion has received word that the hunt is over and they can come home, so the Fresh Prince of Noldor has gone to see his baby mama again. Coincidentally, a farmer has also arrived, saying that his cow is sick because her milk is blacker than the south side of Chicago. Hearing this, the Fresh Prince of Noldor and his baby mama run off to the nearby village to check out everything and leave their fucking son behind because, you know, baby mama is a responsible adult. And when they get to the village, it looks like Sean Yu was just there. Meanwhile, Theo, back in town, sneaks into a barn and finds what may as well be a fucking Daedric artifact under the floorboards with the same mysterious symbol we've seen before on it. Lastly, we catch up with the Harfoots, a subspecies of Hobbit, because copyright, and they have plants in their hair for some fucking reason, but the main character, Nori, has found a man who crashed to Arda in a meteor. And that's it. You see, this would be too easy a review to blast the show for more superficial details like all the diversity hires or the political agenda and allegory that's more in your face than a kid-friendly drag show. So let's try to stay focused on the usual story, writing, characters, logistics, and consistency and dive into the first of hopefully only one season to come. To start, as you've probably figured out by now, this show has the accuracy of Stevie Wonder training stormtroopers in marksmanship, so if you had hopes of seeing any character being halfway recognizable from their originals, then your hopes will be dashed on the rocks like you were fishing off of Niagara Falls. Well over 80% of the Silmarillion has been completely ignored in order to jump straight into this story, so even fans who wanted to see the aptly mentioned Morgoth, or the lesser but still important Ungoliant, don't even get a silhouette because, again, the series can't move past Sauron because that's all these writers know. This is the biggest problem from the get-go. I've mentioned this in a few replies and tweets that the writers behind this show must have 
little to no life experience, evidenced by the general dialogue sounding like an inexperienced Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Some moments are supposed to be deep and meaningful, but written like the writers typed a sentence into an RPG randomizer, then copy-pasted it into the script. The aforementioned older brother of Galadriel, Finrod, does this by asking, I'll paraphrase, Do you know the difference between a ruck and a ship? Rucks always look down while ships look up towards the stars to guide them. He's over here sounding like Jaden Smith because I can think of quite a few differences between a rock and a ship, and it has nothing to do with whatever pipe weed he must be smoking. Not to mention, none of the races really speak their own language or have different accents. Some characters do here and there, but it's few and far between, so if you wanted different dialect out of this billion dollar show, well, that was just too much to ask for. The writing, of course, isn't limited to just the dialogue, but the characters as well, and oh man, some of these characters are fucking terrible, while others do just well enough to fly under the radar. Characters like Nori Brandyfoot and Elrond the Foreheaded haven't really had time to do anything worth mentioning in this first episode, so until they really mess up, I'm not gonna worry about them too much. Although I'm a little sick and tired of Elrond the Foreheaded rolling his tongue whenever he pronounces Gadadriel. The Fresh Prince of Noldor, on the other hand, might actually be my favorite character so far. Despite looking like he just entered boot camp, he actually carries himself well and is kind of stoic like the elves are supposed to be, so good on that, I guess. He doesn't give everyone this psychopathic thousand-yard death stare like Galadriel does. You've probably heard this before as well, and by this point, yes, to confirm, Galadriel is the worst character in the series so far. She is obsessed and was willing to let others die in order to accomplish her task, and whenever she is challenged by anyone, the actress slightly puckers her lips, glares at the person, and even starts to subtly shake like she's about to start cutting bitches. She is always right and never wrong, being so intelligent that as a child, when short-haired McDedda's shit tells her his stupid metaphor, Galadriel responds so matter-of-factly that he visibly blue-screens before responding to her. And yeah, she's just as unstoppable in combat like I mentioned before. Galadriel annihilates that snow troll like Ivan Drago got a hold of Apollo Creed. She's like Captain Marvel with just as bland a personality, and ironically, they both have the intelligence of a toaster when the plot needs her to. You see, she could have stayed behind in Linden, or abandoned ship near the shore, instead of, you know, on the other side of the fucking Sundering Sea. That's like trying to swim from Hawaii to California, and I don't care how OP this butchery of Galadriel is, I didn't believe it when Morbius swam back to the US from international waters, and I wouldn't buy it if she made like David Hasselhoff in the Spongebob movie. If Galadriel was removed from this show completely, the Rings of Power would see higher scores across the board. Not by much, though, admittedly, as the problems do not end there. Of all the things to have an issue with, the pacing is slower than drying paint. Across two episodes, I'll cover the second in the next video, we've maybe progressed about ten minutes of actual story. I know these are one-hour episodes compared to almost three-hour movies, but my god, this show is dull. Without interesting dialogue, strong characters, good writing, or interesting sets and backdrops, there really isn't anything here to keep you engaged, and your body might spontaneously develop Parkinson's disease to get the blood flowing. And I mean, even the sets aren't very good. I know miniatures are a dying art, but man, this show could have really used them here. Some of the background shots look like She-Hulk quality CGI, while the actors and actresses stand on sets so plastic you can almost read the Made in China stamp on the sides. Do you remember Rivendell and how it looked amazing? Those backgrounds were spectacular, because much of the city was a model, while the foreground was a hand-built set. Take this as a scale, the entirety of Peter Jackson's trilogy cost roughly $280 million, averaging about $93 million per film. The Rings of Power is almost a billion dollars in total, averaging roughly $89 mil per episode, with eight in total. The only conclusion here is that the teams behind this series, regardless of far more advanced technology and techniques, are just far inferior across the board. There are some ideas I don't mind. The pullback and scrolling of the map from one location to the next isn't a bad idea, but it wouldn't be necessary if the story would stick with some characters and their locations long enough for us to engage with them. The episode jumps from location to location like a squirrel on caffeine. This is the teleporting problem the later seasons of Game of Thrones had, where before, the cast would take 
days or weeks to travel between cities. Then they would just magically take a boat from Essos to Westeros faster than a non-stop flight. The same thing here. Galadriel was up in Forodwaith, far to the north. Then five minutes later, we're all the way on the west coast in Linden. Then the next scene, five to ten minutes after that, Galadriel and the ship have sailed across the entirety of the Sundering Sea? I don't think logistics is a word in the vocabulary of the showrunners. A day's hike between Tir Harad and Hordern for the Fresh Prince of Noldor and his baby mama took the same amount of time as Galadriel traveling well over 3,000 miles from Forodwaith all the way to Valinor. Kinda hard for me to believe Middle-earth is the size of a continent when people warp across it like they're fast traveling in a video game. So, yeah, the Rings of Power is truly here, and by Iluvatar, it is off to an awful beginning. The corporate media is already twisting itself into a pretzel like a Chinese contortionist to prevent all the honest reviews from gaining traction, even hiding the public rating score because of how absolutely demolished it has become, and there is nothing they can do to stop it. If this is the opening hand Amazon has to play, then this series is going to drag Amazon Studios down in flames, and I will be sitting back to watch The Blaze. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.